Um, so I completed my bachelor's in 2005 in psychology. I worked for a little while with severely chronically mentally ill adults, which was tough with just a bachelor's and motivated me to go back to grad school. Um, I did my internship with Heartland Alliance, so working with um, HIV positive clients, focusing on substance abuse treatment. Completed my master's here in Chicago at Adler University about almost a decade ago. Uh, my first job was at ComSite, so it was an employee assistance program. Um, so a lot of times jobs will provide this benefit to, to people that work there, and we get free counseling services, sometimes it's free legal consult, financial consults, um, just anything to help people get their lives back on track. So ComSite was the biggest um, employee assistance program company in Chicago, actually worldwide. Um, I did that for a little while longer with a different company and I shifted more towards phone and video counseling. So I was getting to do therapy with people all over the country. Um, I worked with a lot of people in Alaska so they didn't have access to therapists in their area. Um, so that was a nice service. And then now I'm in Champaign doing outpatient therapy. So it's traditionally what people think of when you think of a therapist or a psychologist. Um, so I meet with people one on one and talk about things like this. Um, so. One of the things, all of this background that I shared is that with all of that experience under my belt, I still feel like, who am I to tell all of you what to do? <laughs> so this is something that I'm sure many of you have experienced as well. Um, and yeah, imposter. So I want to focus on that a little bit more. What is imposter syndrome? Um, so this is a pattern of behavior where people doubt their accomplishments. This is a persistent, internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. So it's that fear of, you know, I'm not really a pole dancer. Um, we're gonna all find out that I'm not really good at this, that I don't know what I'm doing. I'm sure some of those thoughts might be familiar to you. Um, <laughs> so my own experience as well, I don't feel like a real pole dancer. I've been doing this for two and a half years, I'm an instructor, and yet I'm still like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, nothing I do is ever good enough. I'm always judging myself against others. Um, everything I can do can always be better. There's always room for improvement. Um, the Instagram effect, right? We compare ourselves to other people. Um, going online, why is my dip spin not as good as their dip spin? Good stuff, right? So, um, in addition to pull, this affects us in other areas of our lives, right? So, with my illnesses, I have fibromyalgia. Um, frequently, I feel like I'm too sick to be with healthy people. I can't keep up. Um, but then, when I'm with a chronically ill community, because I pull dance, I do all these things, I frequently feel too healthy. So I'm an imposter in both of those, those areas. Like no matter where I go, it's easy for this idea to kind of seep in and infiltrate. Um, even creating this talk, I messaged Sally. I was like, so ironically enough, <laughs> imposter syndrome is activating my heart core. <laughs> so this is uh, it's a very real thing that many, many people experience. Uh, anyone else here ever felt this way in any, any capacity in your life? Yes. Never. No. <laughs> So one of the first things I want to talk about is internal core beliefs. So these are the things that we think about ourselves, the things we think about the world, and how we interact with our world. Um, and a lot of times these get stuck in this negative pattern. So we'll have negative views about ourselves, negative views about the world, about the future, and things that things grand and bleak. So when this happens, for example, how this can affect our behaviors. Uh, let's say I have a really good friend and we do everything together, right? We're like, every night is movie night, we like, chat with each other every morning. All of a sudden, this friend isn't messaging me back. They're not responding to my messages, they're canceling plans, they're sending me short one word responses. If I've got this negative view about myself, I think I'm not good enough, I don't measure up, I'm not a good friend, I might think, what did I do? Wait, no, but that's always the answer, though. right? <laughs> Um, I might beat myself up, I might 
overanalyze myself and you know our conversations of what did I say that was wrong. That, um, now if I have if I have a more positive view of myself or I'm able to challenge that internal dialogue, I might think, wow, my friend, I'm wondering what's going on. I'm worried about them. I hope everything's okay. I might reach out to other friends, spend time with them now because I've got this free time. Um, so it's kind of seeing how you're relating to the world and being able to kind of change that and change how you interact with people. And so how, what else can we do to address this? Aww. <laughs> so it really starts internally. So this is building an internal culture of appreciation. We have to turn this love inwards and build it from inside. Um, so that starts with self-care. And I want to talk a little bit about self-care because this is really, really trendy, right? Everybody's talking about self-care. Treat yourself, do this, do that, get a massage, buy yourself that thing. It's all very heavily focused on capitalism. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. So, <laughs> Cheers. So I want, to, I want us to reframe that just a little bit. So I think of self-care, um, so I work Monday through Thursday, long days, I see clients. Ideally. I want to prep all of my food on the weekends so that I have these meals prepped, ready to go. I buy the food, do I cook it? <laughs> all the intentions are there. <laughs> so Monday I have like a backup. Monday I'm off early. Monday is also whole three at our studio. So now I have an option. I didn't cook on the weekend, it's Monday. Now I can go self-care the shit out of that whole class and feel great for an hour, an hour and a half. Or I can stay home and cook. What one do we normally pick? <laughs> the class, right? <laughs> and then it's done, right? You're done with class and you're like, shit, I need more self care. It's over now, I need something else. So if I stay home, I don't like doing things for myself, but I am more than happy to do things for others, do things for my friends. So I think of future me as a different person. So I can cook food for future Nicole because I know by the time Wednesday comes around, she's going to be a hungry bitch and she does not need to eat. <laughs> <laughs> and so if I take this time to stay home and make this food, A, I'm going to have a nice meal right now, which is self-care, and she is going to feel really great. And then lo and behold, Wednesday comes and I'm like swamped running late. I see this food. <sighs> Thank you, Pastor Nicole, for having your shit together <laughs> to get this for me. I, like, I feel cared for in that moment. And so now I am not only like doing good things for myself to set myself up for success, but I'm also turning that dialogue back around. I'm saying thank you to myself. I'm appreciating myself and the good things that I can do for me. Um, so that's a really good way to kind of flip the script on self-care. Um, so finding really creative ways that you can take care of yourself. Like I, when I have a bad day, I want a pint of ice cream. So ideally like I can try storing one in the back of my freezer so that if Thursday sucks. <laughs> I don't want to go to the store. I've got ice cream in the freezer that I can just sit down and eat, and it feels like somebody else has my back. It was me. I did that. Um, I know myself really well, so I can set myself up for success and take care of myself in different ways. So think of self-care that way, and less of the, like, treat. I mean, still treat yourself, because we all need that. Uh, but I think this is a really important reframe to shift some of the talk about that. Um, and since this is full talks, I want to bring in some full specific things because I'm sure as performers, we all, and not well, just performers, but just people that love doing this, we all kind of have these moments of doubt. Um, so one thing that I, I find is that we plateau, right? We'll make a little bit of progress and then we stop making progress and then new people come up and then fly by us and then we're like, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you can see what you're doing. But then when I'm in that plateau, when I'm really struggling, when I'm beating myself up, I will go back and take a combo I learned in class six months to a year ago. I relearn that combo, and I do it again, and I record it again. That allows me to see the physical differences in my body, because in six months to a year, you're going to have differences in what you're doing. Um, but I remember my head, like my mindset. I remember what that combo felt like when I recorded it. And I know what it felt like today when I did it. 
So the same moves that I'm doing might feel so much easier now. Now my invert is so much lighter than it was the first time I learned this combo. And just having those little things to hold on to um, helps me actually feel the progress as opposed to an instructor saying like, but you're doing great. <laughs> but, but I see the progress and we do, right? We genuinely see that in our fellow classmates and our students and our instructors. We see everyone else doing it, but we don't see them ourselves. Um, and so a lot of that, a lot of the self-talk, a lot of this is talk to yourselves how you would anyone else in your studio. Listen to that voice. How do you talk to yourself? It really matters. Are you your biggest cheerleader or your biggest bully? All of that affects how you interact with yourself, interact with others. I feel like I know a whole specific thing, but I've lost it. And <laughs> <laughs> I had it again, and then I lost it again, because that's life. It comes back to me. It'll tell us. <laughs> Just blurt it out. <laughs> so I also have um, a lot of different, like various Instagram accounts and things that I follow, therapists, other things that people that kind of echo these sentiments. Um, so if you're wanting more resources, more things along this line to just interject into your daily lives, I find that can be really helpful to reinforce this message. Because listening to this talk is great, and you're all going to go home and think about it maybe. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, I'm going to do this self-care stuff. And then life is going to happen. And like a few weeks are going to go by, or even a few days are going to go by, and a lot of this will be in the background. So having that come back every single day in your feed can really help it stay present and help you keep working on it. There was supposed to be a thank you, but it didn't come up. <laughs> Turn and you're gonna try really hard and maybe you don't get out. 
you go down that little path, it's still okay because that effort, you're carbon, you're doing something. So it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So even just thinking about it, going through those steps, I think can be really beneficial. And I see it with my clients that I work with all the time. A lot of the stuff I work with them in session. Mm -hmm. But it's a process. Yeah. I feel very metaphors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like the huge, like all of my clients know me as like the metaphor therapist. <laughs> Um, so that completely spoke to me when we talk about uh, fibromyalgia, and yeah. I sort of struggle with the same thing, having a seizure disorder. It's always, you know, I beat myself about, um, I'm the queen of late cancels, hi Stanley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I wake up and I'm like, okay, the triggers are too strong, like I can't make it to a class. And I guess the question is, are there any ways that you have to be more empathetic to yourself, to mm -hmm. say this isn't my fault? Like, mm -hmm. I don't even know. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think, because I also struggle with that too, I mean, I beat myself up usually for having chronic pain. Um, so, are you familiar with the spin theory? Yes. Yeah, so I use that a lot in trying to rationalize. Um, if you're not familiar with the spin theory, please look it up. Um, it is a very good metaphor for um, educating about how chronically ill people have to manage their uh, pain. I actually think one of the first pull talks it was. Yeah, it was. Um, so I use that a lot in order to kind of justify, like, okay, well, I actually only have this new spoon, so it's okay for me mm -hmm. because I want to do this stuff tomorrow. Sure. So I still use that idea of future me yeah. because, as you know, we can borrow spoons from tomorrow, but then, like, tomorrow sucks not much more. Um, so just, yeah, I mean, finding different ways to talk to yourself to give yourself permission. That's mm -hmm. why I mentioned you can be your biggest cheerleader or your biggest bully. Um, because what would you say to a friend? Even if that is the one question you walk away from with your, here tonight, is when you're, you're in that negative place, what would I say to a friend struggling? If somebody came to me with this problem, what would I say to them? Because you all have good advice. You do. You just don't take it. <laughs> really? trying to help somebody through this that's yeah. not a therapist mm -hmm. and just a friend or something? Even if it feels like you're not doing anything, default to like active and reflective listening. So just listen. Just let, let them talk at you. Let mm -hmm. them tell you what's going on. And then I would encourage you to find a way to reframe it back. What I heard you say was, uh, 
it sounds like this. That must be really hard. And even if you just give that level of reflection and validation, um, that can be so impactful for people and give them that space that what they're feeling is okay. It's okay to go through this. Mm -hmm. And then the reason I say default to that is many of us are fixers. We want to help people. We want to please them. Mm -hmm. So then we're like, oh, have you tried this? You should do this thing. And then they don't take our advice. And we're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> We do that. We do. We then feel bitter because we offered something and then they're still struggling with it. So right. we don't need to give up that emotional labor unless they ask for it. Yeah. Yeah. Just listen. <laughs> just listen. I mean, just start there, and then you feel like you're not investing as much. They feel validated, and they not they may not even need a lot of solutions. Well, even sometimes just hearing it back, you know, like and hearing someone say like that sounds hard. You're like, oh, thank God, I'm not imagining yes. it. You know, like because especially sometimes I get imposter syndrome about my imposter yes. syndrome. <laughs> like, yes. should I really be really worried about the fact that I'm worried about? It? someone reframe it to you and validate that they see you are struggling yeah. because it just kind of like brings you back to the moment you're like oh of course I'm tired I've been wrestling with this all day yeah. <laughs> you know it reminds you and if you ever find yourself in a spot where you don't have someone to talk to and you're struggling with that write it down people are always resistant to journaling but doing that mm -hmm. slows you down the same it like it does to say it out loud right. And you don't have to keep it, you can burn it, you can rip it up, you can throw it away. Okay. It's literally a dump to get it out of you so that you have more space in your brain to process the important things you need to do. Mm -hmm. Did that get to what you were? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.